Well, I guess to kind of start off with, Ike, um, I love the fact that you're jumping in the director's chair. Yes, sir. Um, you got to do that when you were on Mindy's show. Yes, sir. Um, did that that experience kind of give you any type of wherewithal of knowing, okay, this is time for me to do it now as a film? Or? Yes, 100%. I, I knew it was something I eventually wanted to do, and Mindy, God bless her, was um, – very uh, adamant of getting me to, to, to direct some episodes of Mindy. And once I kind of learned how to do it, even though I knew it was going to be a much bigger task on an independent film than on a you know, season four of a, of a TV show, um, I, I, I knew it was something I wanted to do. And this specific movie I wrote knowing I would direct it. So I, I, I kind of uh, tailored it because I knew exactly how in my head I wanted to play out. And, and I, I think there's this freedom... In the writing process, if you know you're going to direct it, you, you you don't have to explain it extra. You know what I mean? Like, I'm like, I got it. It's almost like you're doing shorthand notes to yourself. Um, so, so yeah, uh, to answer your question, uh, if it wasn't for the Mindy Project and Mindy, there's no way this movie would have been made. <laughs> and then, That's why I gave her my my paycheck to the movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she, she needed it. She needs yeah, it, man. Yeah. Um, an, a kind of another kind of interesting thing, when you were on Blockers, you were with Kay directing. Yeah. And you've known her... All the way back to Chicago. Yes, sir. Um, did you get any pointers from her? Did you look at that as an experience? I really did. I um, the, th- the, the three kind of people that I thought gave me some great tips, whether they know it or not, was watching K on blockers, which sometimes just things don't work out the way you thought they were. The scene that you, in your mind, you're like, okay, I know how the scene's going to work out, and then you rehearse it, and it just doesn't work out. And K was able to... Um, assess the situation and adapt incredibly quickly and never got like angry and never was like, this isn't what I wanted. Like, it was just like, okay, got it. Let's go. I, I, here's my solution. Let's do it. So that was kind of one is, is adaptation. Um, you know, uh, Jordan, uh, had really good advice too, which is like, this movie exists in your head. And, there are certain things you'll have to compromise on when it comes to, you know, budget and you don't get this person, maybe you don't get this location, but the, the soul of the movie is yours and you can't compromise on that. And if you start trying to make adjustments to, uh, f- based off of other people on your vision, you're going to end up not being happy with it. So, so really stay true to that. And then Seth Rogen gave me some advice that James Franco gave him, which was uh, if you're acting in your movie, you're directing you're going to think that after you've done your coverage that you got it, but you didn't because you're not as good as you think because you're directing and you're outside your mind. So give yourself a little extra take or two because your performance is suffering inherently as a director because you're, you're not a hundred percent present. So those were the three kind of uh, uh, pieces of advice that I kind of had in my head as I was kind of going into it. As far as you, you brought up, you know, sets and losing sets, you guys had the comfort of, Having was it one house or was it separate houses? It was or? one house. We had one one big house, and I knew when we were writing the movie. Um, I've seen a lot of bad indies that take place in one location, and and so uh, I I knew that having it in one location would allow us to make the movie, especially once we found the house. But the challenge was going to be how do we make this visually stimulating and, 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 and changing throughout. Because if it's just the same house and the same location over and over again, people are, their eyes are going to get bored. So the challenge was to kind of uh, make the, the look of the film, the visual look change throughout. And you kind of probably noticed that early on, the frames are nice and wide and bright and shiny and everything. And then as the story starts to get darker and darker, the frames are getting tighter and tighter and the lighting is getting more burnt orange and stuff. And we're seeing, you know, those, those close shots and stuff. So, so the challenge, it's very easy to write a movie that takes place in one location. It's very hard to shoot a movie that takes place in one location and make it um, uh, heighten as the movie goes along. And then as far as you guys still get a car f- fun scene, you seem to have... Yep. I mean, the, the bump thing was hilarious, by the way. <laughs> yeah. But was it is that fun to kind of escape from the house and do something a little different? And you were with your brother the whole time. So yeah. It's kind of perfect. Yeah, it was amazing. Um, it was uh, uh, yeah, it was nice to have those few little scenes where we got to venture out just because we were feeling a little claustrophobic, you know. Um, but to have my brother with me, who's like a like such a good improviser that whatever happens, he can roll with it, and just someone you trust will be honest with you and say. I don't think we got it yet. Let's, let's go again. So, so it was really nice on those little uh, uh, venturing out scenes to have someone there like I trust, like my brother. 
how did the casting process work? Like, did Tiffany come on first? I mean, how did it all? Yeah, work? I, I, I had a um, pretty good idea of who I wanted for a lot of the characters. Like, I knew I wrote the part for Tiffany because I saw her in the movie Keanu, and I just thought she was so great. So I wrote that part for her. I wrote Peter for John Cho. I've known John for a long time, and I just think he's such a likable sweet man and everyone likes him so I knew I wanted John Cho and then I knew I wanted my brother and I knew I wanted Carrie Brownstein and then as far as everyone else you know there was just kind of different avenues um, uh, UTA recommended Meredith Hagner and I had seen this show Search Party she was on that I loved and I was like yes that's great and uh, you know uh, Nora Dunn and Chris Ellis were people that I had just kind of had in my mind for years and the kind of the, the, the big piece that, that, that kind of eluded us for a second was the character of Mason, which was yeah. ended up playing by Billy Magnuson. And that was really because when I first wrote it, um, the character was a much older guy. And in my mind, it was like uh, Michael Rooker, you know, something okay. like that, like an older craggy guy. And then after Charlottesville, I was like, oh, I want this guy to be young. I want this to be a young guy who's got a messed up worldview and he's an angry guy. And I don't know if he was at Charlottesville, but he might know people who were at Charlottesville or something like that, whatever. And he was someone that was very high on our list, but I didn't think we could get him because he's based in New York and when he's, he's kind of blown up. But he read the script and we, we talked and he's like, okay, I'll do it. And then I think he might be the MVP of the movie. I mean, he is just, he is so scary and, and funny and real and, uh, yeah, so I, I, it was, you know, a lot of it was stuff that was in my head uh, from inception. But uh, I also, again, got lucky with some great help. Yeah, I was worried for you with that knife when it was on your chest. I was like, I know it's a fake knife, but Demi looks like he's really it's good. Re- it's actually real. It's just very dull. I mean, he would have to put, like, another, like, two joules of pressure in to get it into me. But there was a lot of safety talks on that. People were like, hey, it's your first movie. Let's not have a knife in the heart in the first one. Let's, let's leave yourself somewhere to go. Now, I got to ask about, you have a great bloodshot with Carrie. Yes. How did that work? Did she, she played it off so amazing. That was such a wonderful scene. How cool was it to, because that's the only sequence I can think of where you mess up the house a little bit. I mean, that yeah, explodes. it exploded. We had, we, 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 it was really funny because I said to Carrie, uh, our, our stunt guy was like, our effects guy was like, oh, I got this great thing. It's like a, it's like a little gun and it, it shoots up a blast of blood. And I told it to Carrie, and she was like, uh, cool. Wait, it's a gun? What? <laughs> and, and on the day, we kept showing her tests, and it was like a hard pff. So finally, she was like, I think, is there someone who could just squirt it right in my face? <laughs> um, but yeah, we didn't want to trash the house, so we had you know the proper tarps put down and stuff. But that was, uh, I remember like the worst thing would be is like if I like, blinded Carrie Brownstein <laughs> with like fake blood. I would literally never work again. So, uh, but luckily she was game and we were able to get that shot off without anyone getting hurt and minimal damage to the house. You know, as far as writing wise, obviously it's, you're trying to touch on something right now. Something that's impacting us and the guys from, uh, get out and black Klansmen yep. are involved. Did you get to see the end of black Klansmen at all to see the way spike brought in kind of Charlottesville directly and, or was that was that separated? Did they no, no. I I I, um, I I didn't see Black Klansman until it came out in the theater, and my this was already locked. Um, it was kind of funny though. Um, initially, the very beginning of the oath is not too dissimilar from the very end of Black Klansman. Black Klansman opens with that horrible package that kind of shows Charlottesville and blah 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 blah. Um, and we toyed with in the beginning of. Um, a lot of footage of protests and riots and stuff, but then we were just like, it's so much real estate and I'd rather just get to it right away and let's make, so what we did is we built that kind of audio landscape, soundscape, right, where it's, you're hearing the riots and you're hearing the police and a reporter getting beaten up by a crowd who's chanting something and then we're into the movie. Um, but, you know, that the end of Black Klansman, it's so powerful and you know, Black Klansman, I thought, was a surprisingly light film. It was quite funny, I thought. Um, but I th- I, that ending, you walk out of that theater outraged, and you're just so angry and fired up. And 
this is a different movie than that. I really wanted this to um, have a optimistic ending because I am optimistic about this country. I am optimistic about the state we're in. I know we're very divided and people are fighting, but I do feel like this too shall pass and it will be forever changed. But it was important to me that we end the movie on up note. And it's literally the camera is behind us at the end because it's, everything's behind us and we're moving forward and we have some scars. But uh, I want to move. Uh, I want to move forward. And I think Spike does the opposite, which is appropriate for that movie. Spike mm-hmm. is like saying, "Like we got a big problem right <laughs> now." So, uh, but but yeah, I was aware of it. I'm kind of curious. Your 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 father. You've I think you just uh, had another three. Yeah, three girls. Congrats on the most recent. Thank you. Yeah. Um, this daughter in this movie is a little closer to your your age of, of daughters. Yeah. Um, is it fun to play a father? Is it spooky? Is it weird? You know, it, <laughs> normally it's great. It, this was so, and she's a wonderful actress, Priya Ferguson. She's on Stranger Things. She's great. But um, this was just something that I knew that I, 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 it was important to the story that I am a father, but I didn't get a lot of scenes with her. Mm-hmm. So there wasn't enough bonding and there wasn't, I, it never, it real, always felt like, I love you. It's so good to see you. I have to go set up the stunt now. So I'll, I'll see you in a couple of days. Um, but uh, I, I do love playing a father and it really does kind of come second nature to me now. And, um, you know, with that said, always better to shoot without kids just because you you don't want them to hear a bad word yeah you know they have certain hours they can work so it's it's always tricky to have you know kids involved but if you're gonna have a kid in your movie cast Priya because she's an angel well it's interesting even I think one of the funniest scenes is when Nora calls you and she's like can I show him the BFG and you're like whoop at that moment in the movie obviously it's ridiculous <laughs> very ridiculous um that you even brought in the kids in that scene. It was. It always felt like you always kind of had a sensibility of family throughout the film. Is that was that always in the writing that you wanted to make it a family drama? It's something that's insular or, or yeah. Know? No, it was the message of the movie. Always to me has been we can't let these external forces affect our core mm-hmm. and families are being torn asunder right now. And look, there are some that the damage is irreparable and after there is another paradigm shift in America and maybe we have a different president, different government and stuff. A lot of those families are not going to come back together. People have just decided like, this is a line I'm not crossing it. And I know where you are, but I, again, you know, I, I do, I I really wanted to, um, I really wanted to show the familial optimism and like, we're going to be okay. We stayed together. No one died. We didn't kill this man in our home. (laughs) So, 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 uh, the family aspect of it was so important to me. And, you know, um, I think, you know, five years ago, having a, playing a character that had a kid wouldn't be, wouldn't be of huge importance to me. But once you have a kid, um, you understand what's at stake, and it makes everything that much more worth fighting for. You get to do a little animation in you in your your career. You've done a little bit of animation. Yes, the awesomes. <laughs> do you, yeah. Do you find yourself leaning towards wanting to do slightly different comedy because you are a dad now? Um. Yeah, a little bit. I mean, I, I definitely. I, you know, there's been a few movies that have come up in the last uh, few years where. You know, I'm playing, uh, you know, the, the, the man child, the guy who still wants to drink beer with his boys. And I'm kind of like, I think I'm a little too old for that now. You know, I think, um, you know, I think Blockers was kind of a good pivot to move or a good uh, kind of stepping stone to go from that kind of neighbors, fratty, you know, guy to same style of movie, but like a dad and like the emotional resonance lies between the relationship between me and my daughter and Leslie and her daughter and stuff. And, and, you know, I, I, I do think, um, you know, you just get the more perspective you get in, in life, the, that the, the, your art, I think, is going to change, and nothing gives you more perspective than having kids. My God, I think it gives you too much perspective. I want less perspective, <laughs> <laughs> but um, but yeah, I think it does definitely uh, affect the uh, the roles uh, I do. I know you're a bit of a foodie, or at least on Instagram, I feel like you're kind of crazy about. Brother, it. I had a chicken fried chicken yesterday with spicy gravy. It was like one of the best things I've ever had in my life. Do ever. you do you look? For, I know you got family here too. Do you yeah. look forward just to coming for the food? Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially Texas, man. Like I, we had to take that shuttle this morning from Austin to Dallas, and um, 
uh, we brought queso onto a bus, <laughs> which is not great. Like it, a, a small bu- a bus is not an optimal place to eat queso, but I didn't care. I brought queso on board. Uh, but yeah, that's kind of the kind of the extra little bonus of going on this fun tour is just like, oh, OK, well, we're going to be in Atlanta and I know the best ribs in Atlanta, you know. So, uh, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm definitely this is this is 95 percent promote the movie and get people to see it October 19th. The other five percent is. Daddy needs to eat. I need to get my food on, to quote Tina Fey. <laughs> um, I know you're a Chicago guy, too. Um, they need a new mayor, new police chief, maybe side gig. I don't know. <laughs> Being the mayor of Chicago, BJ Novak always tries to t- get me to run for the mayor of Chicago. Uh, yeah, I think right now. <laughs> you have good slogan. Ike's a good name for political people. It, it worked before. Yeah. I still like Ike could be the, the motto. Uh, yeah, maybe one day when I'm uh, completely uh, kicked out of showbiz or something, I'll jump into politics. But I, 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 I think being the mayor of Chicago right now, would, a little too much work. <laughs> There's a lot of work that they need in Chicago, and I'm not down for that yet. But I'll go back and eat pizza and watch baseball. You so don't need to be the mayor for that. So are you your traditional deep dish? Are you? Uh, I'm one of those people who I can like deep dish, but also still appreciate a good thin crust. But if I'm going to have one piece of pizza and it's the last day of my life, I'm getting Illuminati's deep dish pepperoni with butter crust. Like, why mess around? Like, it's, and I get mad at people who are like, that's not pizza. And I'm like, really? It's a round disc of dough with tomato sauce and cheese that's been in an oven for 40 minutes. You're telling me that's not a pizza. So, uh, but yeah, I do love the deep dish. I love that you get to uh, be in the kitchen in this film. Yes. Was that fun? That was fun. I'm a real cook. And I, uh, especially for Thanksgiving, we get like 25 people to the house and I cook, my mom and I cook almost all of it. And... It was very important to me that the, for the food scenes, the food looks good. You know, I, I am someone that when I see a movie and there's appetizing looking food in the movie, I'm like, oh, I'm interested. <laughs> you, you've piqued my curiosity. So, so I was there on set that morning at like 5 a.m., like basting turkeys and making like chopped trevel for the, you know, for the stuffing and stuff. Uh, but it was, uh, and then when my wife saw the movie and she saw that scene, that kind of one shot through the house on Thanksgiving where I'm chopping, she's like, so what is the home video? <laughs> it's like exactly what our Thanksgiving day is like. So I got to ask then Thanksgiving, like what's your, what do you, you have to have at a Thanksgiving menu? Well, I, um, you know, I do two turkeys. I do a roast turkey, but I do a smoked turkey, which is, which is pretty key. Um, but I also do double stuffing. Uh, I do a traditional stuffing, which is, you know, I got sausage and sage and never raisins. <laughs> you put raisins in your stuffing, I'm leaving. All right. They don't belong in there. They're so cloying and sweet. Um, but then I do another one, right? Cause I'm Jewish and, uh, we want to do, I, I had this idea and I tried it and people freaked out where for my other stuffing, I buy pastrami Ooh. and I take rye bread and sauerkraut and mustard and pickles and Swiss cheese. And it's a Reuben stuffing. And I got to tell you, it is one of the greatest things you've ever had. It's so good. And then what I do, is I make a, I'll make like four, right? You know, two of the regular, two of the uh, the new kind. And then I take one and I put it away in the fridge and I don't touch it till the next morning. And then we wake up the next morning, I take that stuffing and I crack eggs on it and put it in the oven. And you got breakfast stuffing. Wow. We're too, ju- yeah, I know, that's a mic, that's, I don't, I don't think I have a question after that. That's, <laughs> I'm hungry now, yeah, early dinner. I'm telling you, pastrami, uh, Reuben stuffing. And it's young and poor, we can't eat. Yeah. You can't eat, man, yeah, sorry. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, well, I guess kind of last question. Um, if, if, if there was a real oath, um, I, I don't know, gosh, how would you, how would you write that? Your, your oath seems soft. Mm-hmm. Like, I, you know, like it was, it wasn't it, that bad of an oath. We wanted to be, we wanted it to be something that was, um, ambiguous enough where you could make a case for people being like, it's fine. It's yeah. the pledge of allegiance basically. But there's just enough language in there that someone like me is like, you want me to sign loyalty to a fascist? <laughs> so, so, um, so we wanted it to be something simple. We really tried and we went back and forth in different versions, something long and various. Um, so, you know, we wanted it just to be open enough that it's believable that characters that you're still rooting for would sign it. Um, but if our president had this wrote an oath it would not be this 
it would be much harder. I swear at everything that I will give you everything if I ever betray you. Like, it would be, like, very, like, fraught and, and over uh, overdone and stuff. So we wanted something a little more neutral. And it'd only be 140 characters, so it wouldn't matter anyway. <laughs> so I hear we heard it first here. Ike's going to be the new mayor. And new mayor of Chicago. And you're out with a, a cookbook for Jewish Thanksgiving. Uh, that's basically my mayoral platform is I will make your Thanksgiving Jewish. And I lost in a landslide. <laughs> I think that's where we cut, yeah.